Okay. So the, the topic of today is really service brokers deep dive. And the reason uh, I've chosen this uh, topic is because we are doing it in a, a community effort together with the DevOps and the Spring user group. So if I just, uh, you'd raise your hand. Who is from the Spring Meetup? Spring Meetup? Okay, a few hands, one, okay. And who is from the DevOps Meetup? Okay, who is from the both? <laughs> okay, cool stuff. So uh, one of the reasons is that uh, by choosing this topic, I thought that I will have something to share for the platform uh, operators for the IT operations and as well as for developers. So I will touch into specific topics and I will try to bring uh, the best I can the information and because there's such a small audience uh, we can interact more so I don't really want to give instructions and step-by-step -step execution that can be followed easily by a GitHub but I really want to have a conversation with you guys and girls and uh, would like to interact so that you know this is really uh, the best part so like if you are attending this time on a Friday uh, evening you're, you're making a sacrifice so let's let's get something uh, for both of, of us really so let's uh, I, I will pause and I really want to explain the why's not necessarily just the what because uh, I've seen so, uh, so many times in the corporate or in the community where people go attend a workshop or read a book and they get the magic recipe and they start implementing and the others who haven't read or haven't attended the conferences, they don't know the whys. They don't have the context. So it's really hard for them to follow and then make it a constructive debate and following blindly without for yourself... Uh, really believing it's just uh, so much harder. So let's, let's build the context together and we will uh, uh, have this session. So I think we will have one hour and a half and uh, definitely the, let, let's have, uh, stop me when you want to ask uh, anything. Uh, and another note, so I recently have a knee injury so I'll have to sit more than, so, so please excuse me. So uh, who am I? So my name is Sergio Bodu. I am uh, based in Singapore. I work for Pivotal as a platform architect for the Asia Pacific and Japan region. So I do have regional responsibility. Uh, I'm also uh, organizing the Singapore Spring User Group and uh, together with Satyam and other uh, community leaders, we organize this DevOps Days conference, which is gonna be the second year. Now, without further ado, so what I'm trying to do with uh, this talk is really get uh, everyone to understand that you know, there, there is value in continuous delivery and ultimately all these technical talks or whatever you are attending, it really should help you either as a developer, as an architect, as an IT operator to be able to uh, answer a couple of questions like you know, how easy can I uh, change anything in my application? Right? Or how often can I release uh, the new features to production? So by answering to these questions, you will establish your uh, release lifecycle and you will know if you're implementing continuous delivery, continuous deployment, continuous integration, and like if you're really doing agile. So you know, just keep in mind, if you are not doing any of this, then it means that you are in a legacy world. Uh, a little bit about, so I mentioned I work for Pivotal. So Pivotal as a, as a company, it's a startup that was founded in 2013, uh, spun out of the assets between VMware, EMC, and uh, General Electric. It really literally had 1,250 people at that time and under the leadership of uh, Paul Maritz. So his vision was to create a company that will create an operating system for the cloud. Uh, now, uh, the latest news was that, you know, uh, sometime back in May, we, uh, uh, we had another round of uh, Series C for seed, which we uh, collected over 650 millions. So we are no longer a startup, but uh, I definitely think we are, uh, uh, we have found a niche market and we are, uh, the uh, the leaders in the platform as a service space. 
Now, why do we see more and more? Uh, so, uh, Anderson has uh, said that software is eating the world. Well, this is actually a depiction of how, how is it doing. So, this is uh, a diagram by CBS Insights where they uh, put all the logos when the startups reached the $1 billion uh, valuation. So these are all the Unicorn Club members. So as you can see, like on, on, on the far right side, you can see almost like a cloud of companies. So all these companies have a valuation of more than $1 billion. Of dollars. This, uh, of course, uh, worries the Wall Street and the traditional companies who are uh, making the end meet. So like for them, it's always about the PNL and profit and losses. Uh, let me give you an example. So this is a slide from Citibank, uh, which was done uh, during the Spring One platform in Las Vegas just a month ago. Uh, so I was fortunate to, uh, to attend this uh, presentation. And this is the way where they s are thinking to uh, do the digital transformation for their uh, portfolio of apps. So this presentation was done that by uh, Brad Miller, and uh, he's the head of digital, and basically he looks at a refactoring from uh, both uh, sides, like top-down and bottoms-up. And interestingly enough, he shared a lot of lessons learned, like how people, after starting doing a bottoms-up approach, they were just looking at it at as, as a refactoring exercise. And now the you know, change uh, the application server, change the framework, without an actual business benefit. So they were just changing uh, some of the plumbing between the applications without adding actual value. So the whole exercise was to cut cost you know, and make it cheaper to run the applications. However, the investment of time and effort to go through this exercise is, again, uh, very significant. So uh, uh, he, he, he joked about it, and he said, like, you know, if you're trying to rebuild a platform in the cloud and you are starting to chop, you know, small pieces of it and will rebuild it, then by the instinct, you'll have this mess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this uh, distributed monolith uh, cloud where you're going to basically repeat all the mistakes that were in the old platform. So you bring all that legacy technical debt. And then more importantly, again, you're going to fail. So, you know, all that uh, uh, faith and that, you know, this time we'll, we'll do it right, it's, it, it's going to the sink. So then, like, you know, Let's ask a question. Uh, you know, how do we fix my legacy system? And then the immediate question is that, you know, it's rather than solving just a technical problem, we need to solve a more cultural problem. Like, how do I fix the culture in my company so that the people uh, in my company are actually building the right system, the right way, and uh, adding value? Now. Uh, let's talk about what we're going to do today. So the goal of uh, the demo that I'm going to present is uh, I'm going to have an Amazon S3 uh, broker that will create S3 bucket that can be automatically bound to your application. So think of it, you know, we have a ton of legacy applications that are either stuck on the mainframe or using NAS or any legacy storage. So in order for them to move to the cloud, uh, one of the prerequisites as part of the 12-factor uh, principles is really to uh, move to stateless application or extract that functionality to uh, a storage that is uh, scalable and resilient in the cloud. So S3 comes in mind. So that's usually a, a prerequisite wh where I see a lot of uh, people asking how do we move you know, from A to B, uh, in this case, like how to move the files or the batch files or whatever reports that they're having. So the service will be using a Spring Boot Starter project to auto-configure the connection as easy as to consume it in a cloud-native uh, way. So one of the other principles of 12-factor uh, is really the way you manage uh, configuration. So rather than having the configuration into your application uh, put together with uh, the code, which then makes it uh, really hard to unbundle and then uh, 
deployed into different environments because that configuration is very specific to, to an environment. And uh, if you bundle it together, then you basically, uh, you're not making it portable. If it's not portable between your development test production, then you are uh, investing a lot of time in just plumbing uh, various, various points in, in your uh, architecture. Then the Spring Boot uh, application will look at those environment variables and will automatically configure the S3 connection. So by, by using this approach, we're actually uh, also improving the security. So you remember, like, and I believe if you are working for any corporate by now is you need to have access to credentials, be it, you know, API keys, uh, database passwords. So there is usually a process but that process requires uh, a manual handoff, like uh, you know, the admin or the IT uh, opens a chat window or sends an email to a developer, and then the developer or the release manager keys in those uh, those credentials into the into the application code or into the uh, XML or uh, property files. So you want to avoid that part. You want to dynamically generate those credentials so that if those services are corrupted, you can immediately uh, remove the access and be safe. And as well, if you're looking at update and upgrade scenarios, that will serve you very well because then you, you, you dyn dynamically generate uh, the credentials and you can bind uh, and unbind, attach uh, all these services as backing services. So we can create a starter project that includes an Amazon S3 template for consuming S3 service instances. All we need to do is include that Amazon uh, S3 project into our... Uh, so think of it, rather than just me handing off a documentation to someone how to write a client, I'm uh, going proactive and creating not just the client, but a template where I'm saying, you know, in the 80% of the use cases, this is how you would probably use the S3. So I'm creating the buckets for you, I'm creating the users, you just need to do your business logic. You know, in the other cases where you need to add maybe billing, maybe auditing, you have to do some customization, but this should be enough. Like, you know, uh, another example would be if you, if you look at the Spring JDBC templates. So of course, during a, uh, when we are persisting data, we need to open a connection. We need to create a prepare statement. We need to execute an SQL. We need to get the result set, and then the result set, we need to map it into a, into a bin or into a, a data object. But those are not serving us any purpose. This is just repetitive code. It's not really a business logic. Really, the customization that we are doing is in that SQL statement that we will... Uh, uh, implement our logic. So what we would have is really a template and then uh, you know we will have that uh, portion of our custom code. Uh, why is that? So basically we want to avoid orchestration, right? Uh, and one of the perils going into this cloud uh, journey is that people you know think that this is again service oriented architecture and go with a bottoms up approach and they break the applications and then they have to orchestrate like you know applications still need to be deployed in a certain order for the workflow to 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 work so if your services or microservices are not independently deployed then you're basically repeating the mistake. You're recreating a distributed monolith. And that's, that's a big pain because, you know, on one hand, uh, you are getting all the worst parts of the legacy system, and then you're creating a big problem because then your deployment is actually much worse than it used to be because you still need to deploy uh, X amount uh, of services. So let me actually... Yep. The orchestration and the controllers. Uh, because uh, if you are writing multiple services, uh, uh, still we need to go for uh, some kind of orchestration. And uh, still we need to call multiple services and then we need to have made in some kind of uh, state in, ca in, ca in, in, in terms of controllers. 
So whereas, uh, is it only about the deployment or is it about calling multiple services from a controller perspective? I think the, the, the best way to describe it is like when you're looking at a microservice being a single deployable unit of work. So it really needs to be uh, independent by itself. Uh, now, it definitely will have dependencies because uh, you know, you might need a caching as a service, you might need some uh, storage, you might need uh, a, a relational database or a, a document store, all of those, or maybe like some authorization and secu security. However, those are dump services in a mean. There should not be a, a leak of uh, business logic between the application and the way uh, which, which, which services you're calling. Because if you're doing that, then the service, again, is not independent. Right? The logic is leaked, and then you, you have the same issues that you used to have with service-oriented architecture. So my question was on the security perspective of exactly. Yeah, but, but security, like, let, let, let's just uh, discuss a little bit, maybe uh, one more uh, minute. Security by itself, it's a cross-cutting uh, uh, concern. So you do need to have security uh, in uh, the whole application. However, that should not impact the, the business logic, right? It's really an input-output uh, processor. So like, you know, you are the denied access to the resource, or you, uh, you know, you're accepted, and then there's another filter that will be executed and until you, you execute your workflow. So what I'm currently having is I'm going to showcase you uh, Cloud Foundry. So, uh, so I do have a Cloud Foundry instance. And more importantly, this is a, a locally uh, Cloud Foundry on my laptop. The way I did it is there's this uh, CLI. So I've started this uh, instance. So I said, OK, please start me a development instance of Cloud Foundry with 8 gigs of memory. So I, uh, I thought 8 gigs of memory will be enough for me to play with the brokers, the applications, the samples, and then the other services. right? Now, because this is uh, a, a development, I also can do all that mean uh, stuff, so I don't need to ask permission. So I have access to the build packs. Okay. Dev resume. So I suspended it. Let me resume the the machine. So the machine is really a virtual box instance. As you can see, it's restoring the state. And now it's going to take just a few seconds. I, it's a mistake, but let me actually show you what I mean by. Is this Bosch, Bosch light based? No, this is uh, um, just a, a virtual machine with all the same components uh, running as containers inside uh, your VM. So. Uh, while that uh, while that VM starts up, let me just sh uh, show you this picture, which will uh, help you understand how it works. So on the left side, we have Pivotal Cloud Foundry, which is our commercial offering, which is again based on the open source Cloud Foundry. So, uh, but it's fair to understand that this is a distributed system. So all its components are uh, standalone uh, virtual machines. So if you're talking Cloud Controller. Log, uh, login, uh, blob store, all of these are components which live by itself in a virtual machine. So a minimum installation requires 28 uh, virtual machines. Now on the right side, I have the same capabilities, but uh, meant for a development uh, workload. Like so, so myself, if I'm a developer and I want to extend the platform, or I want to test the application before I actually deploy it to a, a remote Cloud Foundry, I can do that. And I can just spin up that virtual machine, and uh, all the same components, exactly the same, but running as containers. Now, it, it's fair to understand there is definitely some difference. However, in the terms of contract, API, libraries, uh, it's kept uh, to mirror the same capabilities. However, 
things like uh, Bosch. So, you know, some of the self-healing capabilities are not there. So you still have the applications instances, you still have a marketplace, but it's like, let's say, condensed PCF components. But it's the same uh, API how I would use uh, a Cloud Foundry instance. How many of you are familiar with Cloud Foundry? <laughs> Just a few. So in, in a nutshell, uh, uh, have you used uh, OpenShift, Kubernetes, or any of other uh, platforms, per se? So let's say if you do have a traditional workload now, if you want to deploy an application, then you need to do some amount of middleware configuration. You need to uh, stand up basically a server, install the operating system, add all the runtimes, the shared libraries, and then all the components, and then you can run the application. Now there's a amount of effort that it's like it's repetitive and you'll be doing it for all the other application services. So this needs to be extracted, and the way we extract it is we build this pivotal cloud foundry, uh, which is running applications within containers, and then it uses a Bosch uh, um, tool chain, which is interacting with an infrastructure as a service to build that uh, package. So think of it, you can run the same platform on Amazon Web Services, on OpenStack, on Azure, on Google Cloud, be it public cloud or, or on-premise. But the API remains the same. OK, so uh, PCF Dev is running. So let me just do, so I can do uh, a login. So you notice there is an API yarn point. I'm just going to add admin, admin. Then it prompts me, because this is a multi-tenant environment, it asks me, okay, so I see you have a couple of organizations. So this, in, in that perspective, is like, imagine you have your procurement and then logistics, or you have your uh, HR and then development or IT. They do run applications. There needs to be uh, a role-based authentication. So you would have different organizations so that you can have uh, uh, you can manage quotas, applications, access, and yeah, you had a question. Okay. So I'm just gonna choose PCF Dev. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you the marketplace. So just uh, to show you is we do have already this service created. So I've created a service broker and I've created an Amazon S3 service which is not available by default. Now, the way I can see this is I can look at the application. So you see I have my broker application, which is, again, running as an application instance on this platform. And then I have my demo application. So you can see this is the service brokers that I have. So I have a Redis, RabbitMQ, MySQL, and then my custom Amazon S3. And just to show you that uh, the, the demo. So this is the application sample. Now, it's a simple upload and download application. I've, so I've created an S3 bucket because I have this service. We'll go through the code and uh, follow the steps. The, let me show you the re end result. So I'm going to go and pick a file to upload. So I'm uploading this image. OK. Yeah. Do it again. Uh, 
haven't tested with. So, um, yeah, you can see it's it's the new uh, JPEG image. I, I wanted to upload the. Uh, just do some. Um, so this is the picture which I wanted to upload. This is from uh, last year DevOps days. You see the merry crowd. So far, is the application workflow uh, easy to understand? What we're going to build? Yep. Cool. Let me explain you uh, the patterns that we're going to use. So first of all, like, uh, why go to that extent and creating a service broker? Like, why not just uh, uh, do it in the application itself and just create an S3 uh, service in the application? Well, uh, first and foremost, that will probably duplicate. I'll probably have uh, a few applications that are going, going to repeat the same code. And if I'm going to duplicate that code, that means that I'm going to have different versions. So then I will have uh, to manage those different versions, have operational overhead in terms of how I upgrade and how do I keep, um, you know, let, let's say matching the libraries, uh, avoiding uh, 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 security issues, and so on and so forth. So definitely it's not a good use case for me to duplicate that effort and then have it sprawl into my, uh, uh, into my uh, uh, portfolio of applications. So le let me define uh, like who is a de DevOps consultant. I'm not gonna go into uh, the buzzword of just DevOps, uh, but like let's say this is a description that I got from Patrick de Debois, who is one of the uh, uh, creators who basically created this terminology. So he, this is his description. Like he is a DevOps consultant, and the way he uh, describes himself, he is bridging the gap between projects and operations by using agile techniques in development, project management, and system administration. Well, if I look to it, it's not nothing new. It's the same uh, areas of expertise that we used to have. It's just like now I have fewer people. And I think this is very important because now, uh, you know, not only applications grow uh, more in complex, but we really do not need the middle layer where we have to have uh, layers of layers of business analysts and people who translate requirements. The moment we can have customers working with developers, you know, that uh, if, if that gap is minimal, then we will not have uh, unforeseen uh, uh, results. So like, there will be the same communication. There will not be that gap. Now, another example would be, and this is a, uh, something that I've done or uh, showcased at the previous DevOps, uh, where you know the way it was defined in the beginning it was that this is agile infrastructure, and this is the Gartner diagram. So the way they see DevOps or the expert in this domain is that you know, so we have the development. Uh, we have the quality assurance, and then we have the technology operations. So people who do software engineering, who operate and test, they come together, and we have this DevOps team that takes care of this whole responsibility of delivering end-to-end -end solution. Now, I, I do agree this is really exciting, especially if like, you can tag a single person and assign all this responsibility. However, I do believe that you know, it's more than just that. Like, it not necessarily needs to be the same uh, person that will do all these tasks, but there's definitely a shared of knowledge that needs to be done between these various teams. So as a development, I need to start learning more about the way I manage resources, the way I document my services. It's not really uh, where I can bury it down into my application code and you know, it will blow up into production. I need to start looking and managing the dependencies. Like you know, before I, uh, I uh, deploy my application, I need this database with this schema, with this specific version. So I start doing uh, <coughs> versioning of my database or for messaging queues. I need these specific dependencies. And that creates a responsibility on the develop developer to create 
that manifest, you know, like a recipe, like a cookbook, if you want. Like, this is what I need in order for my application to, to work. And then you go into that microservices uh, domain because if you're able to uh, document all those dependencies, then it's very easy for people to manage it. And if there's a problem, then they can look throughout cookbook and hopefully the application is resilient and it's able to give you a, a, a specific error message that will help you to understand. So far, so clear. Uh, how many developers do we have in the room? Okay, so we do have a lot, which is good. I'm gonna skip the rest. Now let's go to the operations. L many operations and many uh, colleagues of mine with whom I work, they have this amazing number of scripts. Like in every directory, on every server, they have this 50 easy steps to deploy to production. <laughs> You know, they, they document these wiki pages, which is like, yeah, you just do, you know, one to 500, and then like, you know, if you have, like, just repeat it again. So those, those scripts need to go away, or there needs to be a, a better management. So like, you, you no longer re-implement the same recipes, you probably will use a stack, or a framework, or a scripting language that makes all those uh, artifacts reusable, so that you can share amongst, uh, uh, your peers. So if any of you have been programming in Perl, you know how easy it is to implement a one-liner and how hard it is for someone else to maintain it. Uh, now, definitely version control, and it's really about infrastructure as a code, but infrastructure as a code means that you need to develop APIs because you know it's not gonna be a ticket, an email, or a person who's gonna respond to you. So. And then we go into a discussion in APIs. However, I'll skip. Uh, but if you have any questions or you want just clarifications. Um, I'm actually developing a Mac uh, desktop application. So how does Cloud Foundry, I think this is a very basic question. Maybe it's quite, quite off topic. But how does Cloud Foundry can help in that continuous deployment? So currently we are using Jenkins, uh, Jira, GitHub, and all those things. Uh, so it's a desktop application, but how, how many uh, uh, team members do you have? Uh, five. Five. And do you uh, consume any services outside? Yes, it's actually talking to cloud. Basically, it's a mimicking cloud uh, data onto your desktop. Okay, and let me ask you, so how long does the continuous integration lifecycle, let's say from your code commit until all the tests passes, and let's say, uh, some QA and maybe someone uh, does a sign off. So, how, how? so uh, automatic uh, integral, uh, like test automation, in, in test and everything takes maybe like 30 minutes. Like the moment I commit my code, uh, the build starts in Jenkins and uh, unit test, integration test, I think it's done in say 30 minutes. And what uh, do the other people in your team do while that runs? Like they wait? All, all, all five people are developers, they, we just uh, like take up uh, like the user stories based on. Yeah, so, so that's an easy way like just to look at it. If you can parallelize those environments, instead of all your team members sharing the same environment, like if you can, uh, if you are able to provision an environment just for yourself so that you can uh, boost the speed and you can you know, build the environment on demand and then uh, kill it after you've done all your integration testing, then you can uh, you know, you can speed up the whole development life cycle. Can we use Cloud Foundry for desktop class application or is it meant for only for a browser based app? Um, it's, it's meant for services, it's meant for web applications. Uh, it's, if you look at it, it's really how you design your application. Of course, if you, like, I think the, the next question would be how you do this uh, testing. Do you do uh, user interface testing or you do some sort of API testing? Both. We do unit testing of each individual module so doesn't have any interface. Like directly on the uh, module we'll uh, test it and then, then the actual user level they're testing. Where then uh, there's a UI automation testing like go to click and go all these things. Yeah, so I think that uh, unit testing is one way you can help. Then the other part is really uh, the dependency services. Like for example, uh, like, do you use consumer-driven contracts? Like, how do you uh, 
keep up with the new releases of services. Let's say, you know, if one of your dependencies, it's, an up, it's upgraded. Like, do you need to receive like one month in advance to prepare for that deployment? Or you can just do it ad hoc and then have versioning strategies and like, you know. Currently it's called manual. Like, uh, it's a new version, new version of a dependency is released. I mean, and we take it integrated. And, and, and it's all then, list of the C++ applications. Um, C++, I think... Uh, it's, a, it's a Mac Finder-based application. The application as such doesn't have any UI. It's slightly indicated to the Mac Finder. Okay. So definitely there might be use cases where you can uh, benefit, but uh, I feel that uh, you need to look uh, above that. Like, you know, what about the other applications in the portfolio? Like, how do they work together? Because Cloud Foundry is good for running one application, but it's much better if running a fleet of applications. You know, really, you see the benefits once you know all your teams uh, have the same expectations. Like, you know, for yourself, if you're going to move uh, next year or you know into a different team, then you'll not have to relearn 500 easy steps to production. You'll actually, you know you have all the same tooling, the same APIs, and you say, okay, let's just do a CF push. You know, and then everything, you just, I worry about the code. So the moment you uh, use these platforms, it comes with uh, pro and cons. So definitely there's uh, uh, benefits in using it because you will have an API first. Uh, but again, it really depends on your application. Like, you know, what's the workload? Uh, like, you know, how you scale it? Can you say, is it a uh, kind of a competitor or an uh, improvement over Jenkins or something like that, continuous integration, something like that? Uh, how is it uh, compared to uh, what, what we are doing now? So is you can actually uh, run Jenkins on Cloud Foundry. So Cloud Foundry is more than just like a, a running application. It also runs services, and this is why I'm going to demonstrate how this uh, S3 broker can... So basically what you're doing is there's no existing uh, S3 service on the platform, but how you can build it uh, yourself easily, and then how you can bring other services onto the platform. And then ultimately, everyone needs to <coughs> test first. Like, literally, I think the, the best uh, lessons learned, if you are building a cloud native application, or you're going into this new world of uh, uh, is you need to decrease the operational overhead. And by decreasing that operational overhead, if you're doing continuous delivery or continuous integration and you have a QA team, you're not doing it right. You need to automate all those steps because you know, that's your blocker. You're just doing it, you, know, you, you, you jump the fence, but then you have this huge wall, <laughs> you know, this, this gate to pass. So uh, oftentimes you need to begin with uh, uh, test-first approach, be it to your application, be it to your services, to your platform services, so on and so forth. This will ensure that, you know, <coughs> first of all, th that testing can also serve as documentation, the way how application was meant to work. Because oftentimes we see people adding tests as a check, check off, just like to improve the coverage, but, and uh, without the explanation, sometimes you go into the testing the code and it's just like awful. So let's say like if I'm gonna uh, explain or give you a short five minutes uh, description of what's Cloud Foundry. So there's three parts to it. One is these clouds. So Cloud Foundry as a platform is meant to run on these cloud providers or how we call it cloud provider interfaces. So you know uh, infrastructure as a service, like Amazon Web Service, uh, OpenStack, VMware. So they give you the compute, the networking, the storage, all this, uh, all, all, all these APIs, uh, but they are raw. So we have a set of 13 APIs that the cloud provider needs to support, like, for example, creating a disk, attaching a disk, creating a network interface, uh, creating a VM, destroying the VM so that we can uh, orchestrate the, the creation of services and uh, uh, virtual machines. Then the next part is the runtime and framework. So once we've created, you know, that we have the infra underlying infrastructure and we have a layer of uh, uh, abstraction, 
then we can start building high level APIs. Like uh, you are a, a Java developer, you probably need an operating system with uh, JDK installed on it so that you can uh, run your code. You, you have a Python application, then you need a Python interpreter. You have a Ruby, you need a Ruby interpreter. You have a binary application, then you just need to run a Sage or BAT file. You have PHP, uh, .NET, Node.js, it comes with its uh, extension points. But fair to say there is like this concept of build packs and framework that will help you gather all these dependencies. And I'll just show you in a minute. Now you have app services and service brokers. So if you look at it is the application by itself, it will consume services. Like I don't see a benefit as an application developer for you to actually go and build your database or build a messaging service or build a caching service. Like literally, if you're doing that, then you probably should work into a, a vendor space. And, and that might be right. Maybe that's your differentiator. But if you are defining or creating custom application, mobile applications, then you really are more uh, focused on the user experience and how the customer will interact with the application and how it will consume the data and how you can monetize that aspect and really work in a uh, close feedback loop to improve your service rather than just like work on this uh, uh, patching of how the backing service works. You know, how the disk, how the driver, uh, how the drivers for the disk working or how the, uh, the network drivers and so on and so forth. Now, I don't want to go into more details, but like this is a, a really small uh, picture of Cloud Foundry architecture. So you have the Pivotal network. This is the way how you download the software. So Pivotal Cloud Foundry is a software package. It needs the underlying infrastructure to, to be able to work and give you the, so there's no manual wiring. Uh, this needs to be done by some, someone, and that's why we have the dependency on the infrastructure as a service. Then we have the apps manager, which is really to manage the applications, uh, really the application layer, the custom, uh, customer facing applications. And we have a Cloud Foundry API and then a service broker marketplace. Now, the service marketplace is really to expose, as I sh said, shared services, foundational service. Like think of it as continuous integration. That's a con that continuous integration can be used by n number of applications. Uh, database as a service, again, can be used by n number of services. I can you know, map it one to one or one to n. It's really how I design my application. And the same goes for not just data services, but mobile services, caching as a service, messaging as a service. Like this is really how I take benefit of a catalog and then create my custom application where I really need to focus on the logic rather than just on the plumbing. And then where I deploy that logic. As I said, like you do have an application, you as a developer you build that artifact and you really should not be worried. Like, you know, the worst that I need is really to write a Docker file where I document how I which Linux version, which operating system, which runtime I need to do. Because if I do that it's really hard for me to maintain a governance. And that might be true if you're a startup. Um, this is where we go into a conversation like how you manage risk and acquiring customers. Like really, if you're a startup, you know, do whatever works. Like oftentimes I get asked, like, how do we do this microservices architecture? And then the question that I ask is like, do you have customers? I do not have customers. Maybe that's the first priority where you should work and work on the getting the customers and the feedback, and then you can worry about the microservice architecture. The same, this is really for uh, corporations, for small and medium uh, businesses that have uh, customers, and they don't want to dwell on the operational overhead. So, this is a question regarding the service broker functionalities or functions. So let's say I want to use a MySQL service broker. I still have to write uh, the JDBC template, and uh, you have to still write the SQL query. And uh, the service broker, I just uh, say I'm writing a service. I just bind that uh, uh, my service into the service broker service name. So what exactly, like uh, in terms of functionality, if you have to list it out, so what other thing it exactly does? 
let me just go uh, quickly over this and then I'll re reply back to. So w when I try to elaborate on what's a microservice, I like very much to present this picture because then it gives people an understanding in terms of like wha what is a service. So you know, the question is like how many microservices do you see on this web page, which is an Amazon product page. And animation should start right now, yep. So you have all these boxes highlighting different parts of it, which are independent functionality that can be deployed independently, and they are managed by different teams. So you totally have uh, 11 services. So here you have your recommendation service, your shipment service, your description and catalog, availability, and then uh, uh, currency exchange, and so on and so forth. And why, why is uh, Amazon that successful? So this is a post from 2003. It, uh, it appeared on the, on the wild, wild web, World Wide Web by mistake because an internal uh, employee disclosed this internal memo. So this is really how Jeff Bezos uh, brought top-down uh, microservices architecture on the teams. So rather than having all these teams going to the meetings and discussing how they are going to you know, uh, manage the release or manage the integration, he said, like, if you are an independent team, you know, famous two pizza team, you're going to create a service and then all the applications that are consuming it, you're going to abide by this contract defined by you and you're going to give them an SLA. So if they uh, implement this contract, then you give them the guarantee that you'll support them. And of course, he ends up like whoever, like no exception, anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. <laughs> so like this gives you like a, you know, no return policy. Like, and now let me get back to you. So when you have like a uh, JDBC, so there's two parts of it. One is the client part and the other one is the operational aspect. So for the operational aspect, this is where the service broker comes in. So you need to understand like for a service broker to work, there needs to be a table space. There needs to be a schema. There needs to be a user that is created, you know, so that you have that resource. And obviously, that resource needs to be contained, and you know, there needs to be role, access, privilege. And then, if you are using a multi-tenant environment, then you have different options, different SLA. Say your MySQL could be a, a Oracle Rack cluster and have one level of SLA. It could be a standalone MySQL you know, in a VM, or it could be an in-memory database. And that's really the plan or the service uh, SLA that you are uh, deciding from an operational aspect. Whereas from a development aspect, yes, you still need to write a SQL query. Of course, there are now frameworks like Spring or even you know, Sinatra in Ruby or in Python where you don't go and write all that boilerplate. Like in Spring, you really are focusing just like you don't even write now the query. Like you write that JPA interface like and where you say like find by name and that immediately will convert into a SQL query where we'll say select star uh, or select uh, star from uh, employees where name uh, equals blah. Right, so this can be done uh, magically because you know, there's really not that complicated. Like, honestly, if you are going to implement again and look at the database contract, it's really a uh, Java Persistence API that tells, okay, I need a socket, so you need to open the connection, give me the query, and this is the result. So for you, say like, okay, so really the business logic that you uh, code into your application is that query and what you do with the result after. Like the rest is just like repetitive. It, it, it's not different from a report, from a login, or from any other functionality that works with a persistence API, right? So you do need to think in terms of client as a, a developer, like how I'm consuming this service and what custom functionality I'm using. And then the operational, where like I need to manage different versions, like you know, there will be uh, schema changes, like how do I upgrade the schemas? How do I run DDL and uh, uh, other queries? You know, how I upgrade libraries? Like, you know, there's a, there a TCP connection, and like, I need to upgrade the database, and then I upgrade the client library. So this is all operational. That needs to be done by someone 
who has a governance on the entire uh, data data layer, like you know, like a CIO who manages the information. And then for you as a developer, you just worry, okay, so I'm given uh, a persistence API, and for me it's enough. This is the enough the, the SLA that I've been given. So what I'll do, I'll code using that, in, uh, having that in mind. This is another example of a distributed monolith. Like, I, I, uh, I really want to explain that uh, you need to keep things separate and as simple as possible because like, often time, uh, using a same example, like if I'm managing the database and then I write a query, then there's that vicious uh, circle where like, am I a database administrator or am I a developer? Like, Am I an expert in optimizing the queries and uh, you know, looking after the table space indexes, or am I really implementing the custom logic and working with the customer to, to understand the requirements and moving on the right. user experience rather than just like on the uh, let's managing the that layer. Even before the service broker was uh, introduced uh, long before that. I used to still connect to the database with the connection parameters which are pretty contract oriented. Meaning in terms of JPA and JDBC still. Yeah, and that's where like an application, but who was solving for you the provisioning? Like who was updating those credentials? Who was managing the availability? Let's say, you know, soon enough, you need to delete your application. Or, you know, like who takes care of those aspects? Or you want to update your application and then migrate the database. Who, who's going to take off? The operations team typically are the infrastructure team. And what's the API that they are giving? It's really just like a closed world. They are not giving you any API. Like you are not informed. It's just they will tell you a window. Like during this time, we're going to do something magic. And you just like, you know, wait until we, uh, the service is available. Rather than for you choosing like, you know, well, you are giving me a new catalog service. Like this is, you know, maybe like version seven, but you know, I'm still not compelled because I'm still the SLA that I have, it, it's fine for my application. And then you move on your choice. But then it doesn't stop the platform engineer and the platform architects, you know, like the, the guys who are managing that platform as a whole to, to improve their service offerings. So like, what are, like, if you can deploy your services independently, then they aren't microservices. So what should you do? You should decouple, you should transform the data, use a strangler pattern. So really carve out a functionality in that big monolith, you know, or how you're managing that data, and just build a new service, and then migrate your users to use this new service, and then just like remove it, like, uh, you know, decommission that once you have the hundred percent of your users on the new on the new service. Uh, start doing API first design because oftentimes, like if you remember, we had in the university like how you should design the schemas and how you should rationalize the design, like how you should do the normalization, and then you have different levels of uh, database normalization. Whereas that is not really important. Like this is very good from a database perspective, but clients are not using the database. They're looking at the, a specific workflow. Like if I'm like, you know, buying uh, something from an online workshop, I really don't care if there's like five, 10 tables or 20 tables. I really want a seamless interaction. Like I want the item to be charged on my card and then shipped to my home and I will pay you know, the, the fees. And then I want to be informed about the, you know, when it's gonna arrive. It's totally different how we, we used to do database modeling. Like we would usually go into the database and then see like, okay, this is a foreign key and then this is how you do like all this nice, like it, it, it looked very well on a dashboard, but it was so uh, hard to implement uh, a usable service. Like oftentimes it will, uh, deadlock or it will uh, time out or it will have an awful experience like you know it would just be a spinning wheel where like you know waiting and then consumer driven contracts and that's where like I think if you are going microservices and you want to do it independently 
like you still want to have that reassurance that once I deploy my application, it's working end to end. Now, the trouble with that is that now you've split it and you have that independent. However, if you want to run, you know, like a full uh, end to end test for your entire portfolio of applications, then that means that for every commit that you have, you need to deploy all the applications, all the dependencies. And that's going to be very expensive. So rather than just like deploying your whole application portfolio, you just like look at the dependencies. And if you change a specific service, then it just need to verify the contract with its dependencies. And if those contracts are still true, then you know, the assumption is that everything is going to work as fine. So there's like a new, uh, a new way, and there's this new layer that you need to implement, consumer-driven contracts. And the way it works yeah. is, you know, I define a new service. If someone uses my service, it needs to write a contract and commit it as a test on my project. So this way, I'm actually informed that someone is using this service, and there's this specific SLA. So they're using version one, version two, into this. You know, they're expecting this SLA. So like, you know, let's say a, a reporting that just does quarterly reporting. You know, so they are going to submit and check in a test into my uh, service. So every time I'm going to release, I need to be mindful and say, OK, so I still have those users that are still running it. And then the same is being executed on their side. So they have this as a mock-up and say, like, OK, as long as, you know, so I have the test. So whenever there is a change into that application, if, if it fails that, it will just break. So it will not release. So just mock it. I really do not need that real application to be side by side mm -hmm. with me. Is it clear? I know consumer driven contract is really uh, a very new topic and quite interesting in, in terms of its implementation. Uh, so it's. It's between integration testing and mocking. So after the day, it is done like uh, you run the APIs on the account. Yeah, that's very much like an API test. However, it's not an end-to-end uh, testing. So you're not really testing with uh, the real application. You're really mocking it, but it still crosses the network bound. So that means that you will treat it as an external service. You're not going to work with it as an in-memory, you know, like a, a stub. You really are going uh, to test the contract. OK, now let me go into why customer services uh, you know, are very important, like beside the application uh, lifecycle. So I know people, Docker, Docker, Docker. Like, you know, you have this container, and then you run it the application, and that's, this is fine. This is a good packaging format. However, you need to think about your services and SLA. Like, how do they operate it? You know, there's very much a big difference how you run a Redis instance versus a Oracle instance versus a RabbitMQ instance. Like, just in their behavior and what they're doing and then what they need as resources, it's very different. So, you know, uh, there's three options how you bring a new service into the platform. So the first one is the one that I'm going to mention today. So it's a service broker. So it's a simple and consistent way to access services that are running on Cloud Foundry. So there is a contract, what I, what I meant to say. And that's five RESTful APIs that you need to implement. And if you're implementing those, then you can have uh, an offering on the marketplace. Then there is custom PCF tile and user provided. User provided, it's very like you know, if you need to uh, integrate uh, a Samba server or email servers where the uh, user credentials don't change and you just can use it as a dumb endpoint, well, just use it as it is. You don't need a special offering. Whereas with service brokers and custom tiles, you can go more, uh, have more interesting use cases. Like you can implement chargeback model, like you know, as I want to know who is using my service so that I can have their cost center and then have a billing report every month. I want to know the uh, usage patterns. I want to run some analytics and see like, you know, who is using my latest version versus version one, version two. Like what's, what's really the feedback rather than going person by person and doing. With a PCF tile, you can interact then with uh, 
the operations manager and really uh, have a portable cloud offering. In more details, so like where you would see and why uh, you can use a specific service broker. So like this is really uh, the five APIs which I mentioned. So you need, you need to have a catalog offering. Like, you know, if I'm a new applications and I don't have a person to inquiry then this is the endpoint where I'll check, okay, so what's the service name? What's the description? Which plans are available? And how can I create? Like, what requirements do you need? Then once you have that, you can create uh, a service instance. So like, you know, I have the, uh, the catalog. I know the broker. I know the plan. I know the parameters. I can create, so I can submit that put request to put a service instance with a name uh, with all those parameters. The next one is I've created that service, but now what I want to do, I want to consume it. So bear in mind, the service can be one to many associates. So I can have a database that it's used by two, three applications, or just one. Or I have a messaging broker, which is again used by one application or by multiple applications. It's really my use case. So that's where like, I have this uh, offering where I can bind an application to a service instance. And, and of course, I can do the reverse. I can unbind it. And then ultimately, if the service is not needed and I want to free the resources, I just delete it. So far, s clear, like it's very simple API. So this is repeatable, the actual connection. It's only provisioning part. So this is the API that I, as a as a client would use in interacting with the service broker, the implementation details will be uh, part of the s uh, service implement. So like, you know, it could be, uh, you know, if I'm provisioning a database, then I will have, you know, uh, have to create the table space, have to create the schema, have to create the user, or in my case with Amazon S3, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a bucket, I'm gonna create an I am user, I'm going to put a specific policy on that bucket with that user so that it's being able to access. And then for the client, I will allow it to upload and uh, delete you know, uh, images or files on that bucket. So those are the extra endpoints you will implement as part of yes. the service broker? Yes. In, in addition to this uh, provisioning aspect? So this is the API, the way I interact. Now when the catalog is really an information service. We'll, we'll go into the code uh, very shortly. The creation, it's really how I reserve the resources. Or what do I do in order, f you know. The client expects for me to create a, a database with a certain SLA, let's, let's say 512 megabytes. Then I need to create that, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go quickly and uh, so I mentioned the Cloud Foundry, right? So I have the demo working, so I prove it to you. Now I go and ask the demo gods to be very easy on me and allow me to do that again, live. So I have these applications. I'm gonna delete the, uh, the sample app. How about now? Can you see? Yep. So I'm just doing, uh, I can do either delete or D. That's the shorthand. So I'm saying like, please delete this application force. So it goes and deletes. I then uh, have the services, right? So I delete the service, delete service or DS and say, okay, delete my service again force. And then in the meantime, I'm gonna look what's. Yeah, just a moment. Okay. Uh, so I'm still gonna concentrate on the on the upper body. So now I want to disable the services. So 
So earlier I enabled the service access. Now I'm going to disable the service access, right? So I'm now going and cleaning up the environment to have a clean new environment. I'm going to delete the S3 broker. I deleted the broker. And notice I still have a database. So let me delete this database as well. Now that's easy, right? I could have scripted, but I just wanted to show you that everything is API driven, so I can easily go with a CLI and order and clean up everything myself. And then if I go into my marketplace, remember there used to be a S3 offering, now it's gone because I deleted completely. Now I'm gonna go back and just explain you what I'm gonna do in, uh, in simple words. So I'm going to demo the uh, create this S3 service broker. Then I'm going to extend a string boot application to consume the service. And then I'm going to deploy uh, the sample with that library so that I really don't do any configuration. It's just like, you know, as I mentioned, a template. Let me just, I mentioned the template. So are you guys familiar with uh, template? This is a design pattern from Gang of Force. So on top, you have the definition by wiki. So in the template method of this design pattern, one or more algorithm steps can be done or written by subclasses to allow different behaviors while ensuring that the overarching algorithm is still followed. Pretty complex. Now the below one is the definition of a template in an open office, like a document. And this is much easier for me to understand, to be fair. So like a, a template, what I would expect, this is a model, how I create other documents. You know, on top of it. So, for example, if I'm going to create an invoice, I have a template with the logo and then the footer of my company, and then I just like write key in the uh, the numbers into that template, right? And then I create a new invoice. And this is very easy to relate. So, I, I think the same if we apply in technology, where like you know, a lot of it it's really about uh, having bridging that gap. And if you just like uh, go your way with buzzwords, like though you like sound very smart, and like people are fearful of you, like you know they, they don't want to go into a debate. Like you're not helping anyone. So really, you need to put yourself in the shoes of others. Really explain with their terminology, especially if you're talking to the business or with an IT ops. Like use their conversation, have empathy, and. Uh, explain so that you both uh, get benefit from that discussion. Uh, so this is the way you create that service. So I think to your question, like what will happen with a service broker that is like MySQL? So you have this MySQL broker and then this MySQL broker will have like, you know, different plans. Let's say a plan, uh, a paid plan and a free plan. The free plan will be a shared schema into an existing database. Whereas with a paid, you're actually provisioning a new database, a new virtual machine on demand. And the way you interact is like, okay, so you create the service broker and via the catalog because you need to know what's the service offering and what's the API and how to interact. Like every service broker will need a specific set of parameters. Like when you're creating a, uh, a, a database, you need to give it one set of parameters. When you're creating a messaging, it's a different set of parameters and so on and so forth. So then you have inquired the marketplace, you create the service, you bind the service, very much the same. And there's this link. So I'm gonna share the slides. You can go again and look through that docs very useful. Read the docs. Now, how it works in terms of just like a, uh, a graphic. So from a CLI, I'm going to say, please create this service, which is you know hitting that REST endpoint, which talks to the cloud controller. The cloud controller then communicates with the service broker and gathers all the parameters. It, it knows the user. And I have the privilege, like for example, before that, it can verify, like, I'm just an auditor. I cannot create services or I'm not allowed access 
to that service because it's paid and I am just a freemium user. So all of those will be done as checks before and it doesn't have anything to do with the service broker, like the contract. Like I can have different checks in between. Then I reserve the resources, like if this is a data. Then I bind the service. So that's where I actually obtained the credential. There's really no manual handoff where I will... Uh, Now, if I would look at service broker and give you more examples, like, you know, you have them as a service, and that's where I saw the rise of cloud offerings. So, like, you can have New Relics, SendGrid, MongoLab, ClearDB, which are uh, services available on the cloud. So, when you provision them, they are basically running in a different data center where you can have on premise deployment. So, similarly to your Cloud Foundry installation, which is sitting in your uh, on-premise data center, you can create via Bosch a virtual machine or a set of virtual machines that will build that service offering. Excuse me. Yep. Can you can you explain more on the credential part? The yep. So so let me show you some code. So remember I said catalog? So I have this catalog service, which is really how it's implementing uh, that underlying. So it's code. It says like, okay, get me this catalog and then give a service definition. So if I go, I have a con controller, which is a RESTful controller, which uh, answers to this API context path. So I'm like V2 catalog. So that, you know, Cloud Foundry, when I add this service broker, it can add it to the marketplace. So you see in this controller, which is really implementing the REST uh, implementation, I use the service, which is the underlying business logic. Now, I said previously, like, you know, in terms of the implementation, for my S3 service, let's say if I'm going to create a service, what it's actually meaning to do? Right, so when I'm creating the service, I'm using the Amazon S3 JDK, or not JDK, the SDK. And then you see I'm creating a user with my application ID. Then I create an access key, which by the way, uses the uh, public and the secret key so that I operate with the Amazon S3 part. So this is more on the operational side. So here I create a user, then I create the bucket, then I add the user policy, you see it here? Okay, let me just. You see it here? I attach the user policy, and then I do all that customization so that, you know, the user or when I create that service, I create it in a multi tenant environment, but applications from different services, they will not clash with the bucket definition. So they will not see each other pictures and there's a policy mm -hmm. clear so far I, I can go in more details but they just like think that this is suffice just to go in terms of what's the contract now if I go into service brokers this is actually the application so it's s3 service broker and I'm going to deploy it on Cloud Foundry. You saw it before. I'm going to just redo that again. But let me explain one thing. So you remember I said, this is a Spring Boot application. I'm going to deploy it to Cloud Foundry. And there's definitely some metadata that I want to specify. For example, as I create this broker, there's some credentials or there's some uh, persistence that I want to do. Like, for example, I've created a service for you. I want to know that when I bind this application, I bound it to this. So there's some persistence that I need to do. So you see here in the services, I'm expecting a dependencies. I'm saying I will need a service that goes by this name, you know, S3 Broker DB. I have this artifact which I built, which is in this folder, and I'm going to use this application. I'm going to require 600 megabytes. It's a Java application. So if I do the build packs, right, 
remember when I showed you the three components? Like, I can easily create a service broker in any of these frameworks. Like Ruby, Python, it really doesn't matter because the contract is REST. It's really language agnostic. So far, so clear? Um, so now, if I inquire my marketplace, I say, okay, so I have a Redis, that's not a database, it's a cache. I have a RabbitMQ, which is a messaging service. I have a MySQL, and I have two plans, 500 and one gig. Let me just go ahead and create it. So I'm gonna create Um, okay. Yeah. Create the service, get the uh, service, the plan, and the name. Creating it, and then I just do a CF push. And then I'll just describe what happens. So it's a new application. Uh, there's a new route. This application will be usable on the internet. Currently, it's local deployment, but the same will be executed if I'm going to use uh, uh, our public cloud or, let's say, on-premise. Uh, it is going to still create a route so that I can access that application. There's a few things that happen. So I'm uploading then the bits. I'm binding the service. So this is where the exchange of credentials between my broker and the MySQL database. Then it downloads the Java build pack and then immediately starts to do some pre-processing. So it noticed that I need a JDK, it noticed that I need a memory calculator and then a Spring auto configuration. It can do even more. Like for example, if I would add monitoring, like a new relic or I would add an agent that will need to do logging, it will add all those dependencies. It's just for this example, I'm not gonna use any of those extensions. But suffice to say, from the operational aspect, I can create that governance where I can create a template in how I build and run all my application in a development environment, in a test environment, or production environment. So I build a droplet. So I uploaded the artifact, which is the compiled the jar file. I've added all those dependencies, like the runtime, and then I compile that template so that if needed, I can actually scale it. In this case, I don't need to scale, but if I would want to scale it, it's very much like this, CF scale, S3 broker, and I can say the number of instances and scale to two. I can say the memory, if I want to scale the memory, instead of 600, I can give it one gig, and I can give it the disk space. It's gonna be all the same, I can do it. It's, it's really no difference. So now I pushed it. It's available under this URL. Um, there is a default username and password. It's admin admin for my application. It says that it's up. And let me just go V2 catalog. So you see, I immediately have a description. And because I'm not passing header parameters, like, you know, I'm not actually doing an action, it just gives me a, a default. So I'm missing the version. You know, so there's, you know, the broker expects a contract for a specific version. You know, like I can have different service offerings. This is why it allows me to do these service upgrades for the SLA. Now, you notice if I do marketplace, it's not there. Though I push the broker, I need to inform the Cloud Foundry or the Cloud Controller to create this new service offering. And that's where like, I can add uh, more specific. So I can enable the access for a specific set of users, for a specific organization, for a specific space. And that's where like, I do more of the management aspect. I'm just gonna go and enable access for everyone. Um, Amazon is available. Now, what's gonna happen next is, so I have my S3 service broker. Now, I wanted to show you the ease of use uh, for the application. Now, I said that I'm going to do auto configuration. And I'm creating this Amazon S3 template and auto configuration because I really want to allow my 
developers, you know, in like the 20, 80 percent of rule that if you do have this access key and key secret and you have this bucket for application defined in your environment variables, then you can immediately use this as tree connectivity. I'm going to create for you uh, a connection with the S3 API. You just need to have these dependencies. And then the S3 template, you know, as I said, like it will have these credentials and then it's going to be able to operate with it. So I'm going to, you know, be able to get an object by the key. I'm I'm going to then be able to get the credentials so that I can authentify, right? Like it's a really download upload uh, exercise. Then I said I'm going to create a Spring Boot Starter. Now the reason I want to create a Spring Boot Starter is, do you know about this website? It's called start.spring.io. So it's very similar like how you do the Cloud Foundry marketplace and you get service offerings. This is sort of a marketplace for developers. You know, like if I'm a developer and I want to interact with a messaging queue or a database, like I really can go and say, I'm going to build a web application. I'm going to build a MySQL application that's going to interact with a JDBC driver. Or I'm going to say, Know, some messaging. I'm going to switch to the full version. Why? Because I want to show you. So like, for example, I can start you know, building my pizza from all these uh, various components. So I can build security. I can build uh, REST. I can build HateOS. I can build REST documentation. I can build a template. I can build these various uh, uh, SQL engines, like, you know, I can do it a simple JDBC or I can do it via Java Persistence API or do it via JOC, which is Java Object Oriented Querying. And then I can have cloud components, I can have cloud discovery, cloud routing, cloud, and this is all clients. And when I'm creating that starter, I can actually add a checkbox, like I can literally extend this start, uh, starter project and then add an offering into my uh, business and say like, okay, so if you need to consume uh, S3 or Amazon S3, then just click this, add this dependency to yourself, and like for 80% of the use cases, you just don't need to do anything. Clear? So if you look at the starter, the starter just adds this auto configuration. So then in my application, Notice, I don't have any dependency on Amazon, right? I'm just using this uh, starter, which is auto-configured as a dependency. Now, this solves a couple of uh, easygoing. As I said, it's a template. And you know, for 80% of the use cases, you know, it's, it's dumb, but it will do the work. I will get the credentials, I will get access to the bucket, the policy will be enabled, I will get everything provisioned by the environment. And then in my application, I actually do what it's supposed to do, right? So it's, again, a Spring Boot application. And then I just notice, I don't use the S3. I'm just depending on that Amazon S3 template. And I'm saying the container to initiate it. If you look at it, I'm not creating it. I'm not giving it the credentials. I'm not doing any of that operational aspect. So someone else will do it. I just know, well, I need to use it in, at the runtime. If I'm deploying it to Cloud Foundry and there's this service broker, then the template will read the credentials and then I will be able to access. And then I just, this is my contract. I literally just depend on this Amazon S3 template. Uh, let me show you just quickly what it was really the auto configuration because I think, you know, though I understand some of you are not experts in uh, what happens if you know I do not have Amazon. So the configuration is being a is very smart. 
it's like saying, okay, so if you do not have this bin, Amazon S3 template, if you do not require, and if you do not have these property files, just like, you know, don't do nothing. You know, don't explode into my face because I miss the dependencies. So that means that you probably don't need a, this service offering. But if the developer needs to do it, then it will have a, uh, an exception, and then he will add all these dependencies at the staging phase, not when I'm running it in production. But you can put the, the like, for example, if you add the dependency as for statement, if you... Yeah, but you, you saw, like, the, the way it's being uh, defined is, like, just, you know, if I have this Amazon properties, which is enabled, and someone passes it to me, like, let me show you, like, uh, I'm not, like, in my application, I'm not filling these properties files. I'm really depending on the environment to inject those properties, to manage it. So the service broker will inject the uh, username, pop, username yep. keys yep. and that, yep. right? Yep. So, but uh, this application itself, for example, if it is a, uh, the service name is specified in the, uh, client or the, the consuming application. But don't forget this service broker as part of its logic when I when I showed you earlier, right? It's creating a new user for every service instance. So when I'm creating and provisioning a service, then it's creating that user. So when I'm gonna delete that user, it's gonna delete the resources. So then it just removes that explicit binding. So when I move to a different let's say region, like I'm deploying this application, it's in this region. I'm deploying to another uh, region, it's gonna be a different contract. I don't need to manage it myself. Someone from the operational aspect will just have a configuration in the broker, which will be true for all the other offerings. If I as application developer then, you know, in my application I need to code specific code and say like, okay, so if the host begins with uh, Southeast Asia, then I need to have this explicit if it's from uh, US, then I need to de do this. So you see, like, it, like, you start adding this, and soon enough, you are in a rabbit hole. <laughs> you just like add different ifs, and it's very hard to test. I haven't showed the test because I don't have enough time, but you know, it's unit tested. I build this project. The testing is just going to consume more time. So OK, I enabled. Now I need to create the service broker. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna create a, a, a service and saying like, from this plan, S3 basic, name it S3 service. I know you're wondering, let's say, you know, so I have this application deployed, right? If I'm saying the broker, what can I do? Well, I, do, I can do with it a lot of interesting things. So I can say CF logs, S3 broker. And then I'm gonna push, when I'm gonna push this application, Spring Boot, Amazon, and then here I have my sample. the push now it's going to execute the same steps and bind the application notice how in a few seconds when the binding will happen I'll have the logs output here saying that there is an action you saw it you see the logs it's saying like okay put this instance and then I have the instance UID from this IP and all the information right now I can do the logging on the applications. I can do the logging on the broker. I can even do something really interesting. I can SSH. And for those who know SSH, I'm, I'm inside a container, right? And if I execute top, like you can see, this is a container. And then the only uh, process IDs that are running is my bash, my top, which is just run, my uh, SSHD daemon, and then really the root 
is running on the one so that it can run in the privileged access, and then just a single process. Like if I exit the top and exit the container, it's very compact. It's really just using what it needs to do. I, and as well, I can show you that there is the application. So you can see you know, in my app, I have the boot, I have the work, and then the classes. So you know, everything is there. So I'm, I'm in this container. I can do everything. It's, so I'm going to exit. I deploy the application. Obviously, the application is no longer having these awesome pictures. So I'm going to go again, get my DevOps, upload it. And here you go. The application is in a S3 bucket. <laughs> the end. Uh, but anyway, I, I would like to take some questions or maybe go into more advanced uh, questions or you know topics that I'm sure everyone has. So what's the matter with the username and the keys are everywhere? Yes. So the key, uh, it's provisioned as an uh, environment variable. So let me see if I can do now. Hopefully, I do hope. Uh, so you haven't enabled the actuator. But now the problem is this is recording. So I have my Amazon keys there. So I don't want to disclose them. But uh, it's definitely there. Like, uh, let me show you if I go to my Amazon. But even if I do the CFN, it will show the, the keys, right? So I was hoping. So we do a smart thing. So if you do have the actuator. And then the, the key ends with a specific pref uh, suffix or starts with a prefix, like password key secret, then it just shows you the asterisk. If I do the CFENV, where I go into the environment variables, it's going to show the <laughs> uh, black and white, or white on black. Uh, that's my terminal. So let me just show you. So you see, I uh, run it a couple of times. So I think it's this one. No? This one? Yeah. Okay. So this is the one that I just uploaded a few minutes ago. So. There is also the logic to delete the buckets on the, the previous footage. But obviously, I haven't done a lot. Like, for example, I would do better if I would create it via Bosch. And uh, like, let me just show you a use case if I would create it with Bosch where it will make more sense. So let's say I have the same MySQL uh, example. So I really want to have a multi-node cluster because then I can do load balancing, right? I, I can have that high availability. Like everything about, you know, if you're going to enterprise, it's really about enterprise ready functionality. Like, you know, how you manage the access, how you do the backup, the upgrades. So, like, for example, in this case, I can have my MariaDB server in three availability zones, you know, three standalone uh, virtual machines. Then I can have a proxy, and then I can have a load balancer that will be able to. Uh, you know, load balance depending on the, which, which node is, is available. So it could be a round robin, could be some, uh, some smart logic. But then what also happens is there's data replication amongst the nodes. So I have 300%. You know, uh, so there's failover functionality. There is like all this uh, network marketplace that once I build that Bosch tile, uh, then I can really sell it as an offering on the marketplace. Like, for example, I have 
for example, Cloud Bees, which is Jenkins, which you mentioned. So, like, you know, you can have it. You have Data Stacks, which is Cassandra. You have GitLab, which is a Git offering. You have JFrog, which is Artifactory. You have ELK, which is Elastic uh, Cache, uh, uh, Logstash, and Kibana. So, you have different offerings. So, this is really the catalog once you go uh, and build an application for real users, right? Then, if you build it as a custom style, then you can have installation and configuration. Like, for example, you know, when you're deploying it on uh, Amazon like, and you have a MySQL, you can have an option to use the RDS rather than just provisioning uh, you know, and building the whole MySQL instance by yourself. So you can have those options. Then, as well, you can have a configuration where you uh, can control the availability. Like, you know, I want to have a cluster of three nodes, five nodes. I want to have two load balancers, three load balancers. I want to have nodes of like one terabyte or 500 gig, you know. It's, it's really options that I configure. And then that's where like the whole platform operations and the platform engineering come into place. And they look and take care of it. Like they can do capacity planning. Like as a developer, you know, I hate when my application is down because there's not enough table space or there's not enough uh, space on the disk because of logs. Like, it shouldn't be done by me. But if I'm having my Docker file, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, I'm pretty much stuck. So then I can scale it horizontally and uh, vertically. And you know, and on the other hand, is then I can go and do proactive. Like you know, uh, ultimately. There's patches that needs to be. There's security vulnerability that are disclosed, and then I, as part of my network, I can do rolling releases. Like I say, well, you know, this I've just patched the version. Please, Mr. Customer, upgrade because there's this security vulnerability which is a zero-day bug. You just need, I just patched it, and you just need to do a click install. And that again, from a developer perspective. Uh, nothing changes because it still uses the contract. But from an operational aspect, I still have to do all those exercises. Is it clear? Ask more questions. I feel that I uh, I talk too much and like you know just me telling myself that okay, so you know that. Let's. So I would rather uh, answer questions that you are. Uh, so maybe someone from that side. What you guys? What do you guys think? Guys and ladies, <laughs> was it a useful presentation? Uh, I do hope so. I, you still you came all the way Friday. What's the difference between the commercial cloud foundry and the open source cloud? So the core, the API, it's all the same. The commercial offering is still using uh, the same Elastic runtime. Uh, commercial offering has this all added services, like you know, if you're planning to use. Data, Kafka, Gemfire, API Gateway, Analytics. This is only available as commercial because this is offering that we give SLA support, we upgrade. So really the marketplace is the big difference. And the web GUI. Hmm? And the web uh, interface. Uh, the apps manager and ops manager, yes, like we do have, uh, you know. We have a bizarre kind of thing for creating, binding, yeah, let me actually show you. So, you know, I, I mentioned that. So, for some reason, it's table to exit. Mm, how do you exit? I think there's probably a pop up. No. Uh, can I uh, stop this? Okay, my presentation has gone wrong. I hate when that happens. Mm. Mm. No, you just, uh, it's probably like a pop up uh, has got that focus, and then that pop up is out of the screen. So. 
It's probably under display, I forgot it. Hmm. Any more questions? I'm going to show you the public cloud and I do advise, so like if you go now, run.pivotal.io, you can sign up for a 60 days free trial on our public cloud offering and you can play with the marketplace and you can push applications. So if I go to run.pivotal.io, then I can log in. So you just need to sign up and there will be an SMS just to confirm your identity. We want to avoid bots. Then I sign in. And then this is the UI that you can work. So, you know, like the marketplace, this is a multi-tenant uh, for APJ, so you have multiple spaces. You can see the number of apps that are working. So, for example, here you can see that there's six apps that are stopped. There are 31 apps totally in the work. There's like they're using 32 percent of the quota. Uh, there's the services. There is a billing report. Like you know, this is on the public cloud. You can definitely have uh, the chargeback model, and like you can have you know this amount, who is using uh, which, which spaces, um, you know, if I'm going to the development, I can see per application how much time it was used. So this is all by the service broker and it's using this information. Now if I'm going to a development space, I can see the applications. Can I run this on-premise? Yep, yeah, it's the same, it's the same uh, UI. And then this is the marketplace, which is available on the cloud. Because it's on the cloud, it uses cloud offerings, like I said. Um, but on-premise, it's going to be the same. So for example, you know, I'm going to use. So this is an application that I'm using. It's, it's, a, it's an application that we've done for a long, long time. Uh, yeah, we, we do have uh, Windows applications running. We even have a Bosch that it's able to install uh, Windows servers. So that's definitely available. But desktop application, they need to, like, as, as a matter of fact, they need to run on the client. But we can provision Windows servers. So that's probably it. Um, any more questions? We're on top of the hour, and I don't want to uh, keep you waiting if you don't have to be. Thanks, everyone. I'll uh, make available the slides, and I'll post it to the meetup. So uh, I look forward to see you uh, next time. I'm going for a small surgery, so I'm going to be off for a bit, but definitely looking forward to say hi to everyone. So thanks for coming. Thank now it's Friday, and uh, good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.